Hello everyone, how's it going? Dr. Incompetent here, and I'd like to do a complete beginner's guide to War Tales, shall we? This is a game that I've been playing a ton of and just absolutely have fallen in love with it. It is kind of like Battle Brothers in that it's an open world, strategic, turn-based RPG. However, it's more like XCOM or Shining Force Final Fantasy Tactics in the top-down presentation on squares as opposed to uh, the hexes of Battle Brothers. And there's a lot of nuance in the game that I missed at first, and it's surprisingly deeper than I thought it was at first, too. So what I'm going to do in this guide is we're going to fire up a brand new game. And we're going to start together, and we're going to work through the basics of the game. I'm going to explain the controls, the UI, some tips and tricks for how to survive. And I'm going to do this in an intuitive and natural way by just explaining my thought process as we go. But I'm not going to spoil the game, tell you the fastest route, the best possible party composition, or anything like that. Instead, I'm just going to explain the fundamentals so that you can enjoy the game on your own terms. I'm going to take what I've learned myself through playing and streaming the game and trial and error, and also, and probably more importantly, the awesome comments I've been getting from people either during the stream or on the YouTube videos explaining the details of the game in a way that weren't initially obvious or intuitive to me so that you can get off on a better foot with this game because once you start getting into it once you understand the systems i really think this is a fantastic game now i am playing this on pc using the xbox pc game pass and so what that means is i only have access to the base game no mods no pirates dlc nothing i'm just playing on the base game which is how i think most people um starting out we'll get it and then you might add on dlc later so just understand this is only the base content so i'm going to start a new game and you kind of make your own background when you begin so it says choose your destiny and you can say your companions are what what are they they're apprentice friends looking for an adventure they're men escorting merchants who lost their employer they're deserters fleeing an abusive captain they're young farmers looking for a better life where they're bandits looking to escape the guard now these are all your different choices and if you mouse over each of these choices it gives you the bonuses for each one so for example if you take this top choice apprentices you start with 30 influence which is kind of like your reputation and it's a currency that you spend recruiting new companions um, convincing people of things, sometimes even purchasing things, um, and it's a very nice thing to have. You start with um, five less raw materials than normal. Raw materials are something that you use to repair your armor and equipment after combat. Very important to have. And you start with a swordsman, an archer, a ranger, and a brute. So you start with a party of four, and they have those classes started. And it's good to know that, like, you start with four, but you can recruit more as you go and change your uh, lineup as you see fit. But this is what you will start with. So this is uh, a nice mix of characters. Merchants, you get extra money. You lose two medicine. You get a swordsman, a spearman, a brute, and a warrior. The deserters get extra raw materials but they start with suspicion it's that star icon that's basically uh you are on the run from the law and the higher that is uh the more trouble you're going to get into it's kind of like your um levels of police uh problem in like grand theft auto or something like that so generally you, you want to have that zero there are troops that patrol the road that are like sheriffs or police or militia or whatever and if you are suspicious they will just sometimes fight you and things like that or ask you to pay money uh to you know kind of settle up on your crimes and you know you could start that way if you want uh the farmers i have a let's play of this game this is the background that i chose uh and bandits so you start with stolen stuff now stolen stuff is 
hard to sell uh, up front, but you'll find ways to sell it more easily later. And you can steal from most people in most places in this game, uh, but obviously you run the risk of suspicion and all that. So if you want to play uh, a kind of like, you know, more uh, questionable group, you can go for this. But I honestly think uh, this is a pretty good start. The Apprentice Friends, you can't really go wrong with these. These are all pretty fair. Um, but we'll go ahead and start with this. You can buy raw materials for five crowns each, so it's not a big deal. So we'll select Apprentice Friends, but you could choose whichever one you like. And then you have these three tarot cards that you're kind of aligning, and you get to pick your, again your bonuses. So your companions um, are used to long walks, our cunning fighters uh, show incredible resilience, are excellent at slap games, are quick learners. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what. I like cunning fighters. I mean, you get 10% extra experience and 10% influence bonus. So this will just help us a little bit with the combat portion. But you could choose whichever you like. None of these are bad. And then if they had a flaw, it would be what? And you have to choose what debuff you get. So these are going to be bad a somewhat meek appearance so this makes it so we can carry less eternal dissatisfaction this means that um we are always unhappy i don't like that one myself um critical hit reduced by three uh danger during rest increased by 10 percent because we oversleep and lack of self-confidence so i honestly i'm okay with uh, the danger during rest increased by 10%. Uh, because, and this is kind of shady, you can just view this however you like, but this is always one that you can just save the game before you rest to mitigate. But these other ones, um, I don't like very much. Obviously, they're debuffs. This one would be another to consider. Um, happiness you can make up for if you want. Uh, I don't like reducing crits, but maybe it's not a big deal. I'm just going to be... Uh, because, you know, I have a hard time getting up, so I can relate to that. I'm going to take it. And then, now you choose Exploration Mode. Adaptive or Region Locked? In my Let's Play, I did Region Locked, and we're going to do Region Locked. I don't care for Adaptive, but you can choose whichever you want. The difference is, in Region Locked, it's like you're in the first region, which is the Starter Zone. And you can build up and dominate that area, and then you go to progressively harder areas, like Level 1, Level 2, Level 3. Adaptive, wherever you are, the enemies just scale to be difficult for you so that you never really get a sense of superiority and you're always on your toes. You pick whichever one you like. I personally like seeing my progress and rolling over weaker enemies and feeling like I'm getting stronger. So I'm going to choose Region Locked. And from here, okay, we can choose Combat Difficulty, Survival Difficulty, and Save Mode. So we're going to go with free save mode, which means we can save any time. I like that myself. You can limit it, or you can go Iron Man, which is like one save. Um, and I don't recommend that for your first time. Survival difficulty, you can do novice, experienced, expert, or extreme, and the same for combat. Now, in this guide, um, I'm going to go with experienced for both combat and survivability. Or, uh, yeah, survival. You can go easier if you like, or more challenging. This is kind of what I feel. This is what I did in my Let's Play, and what it feels like as just the intended default difficulty. All right. So once you have set all of that, you get into your party, and you can customize these people. What does that mean? Well, you can like uh, click on this guy, for example, and you can customize anything you want about them. Their appearance, their name, um, their starting weapon, and you can change their skill. So th this guy has a bow, and... Uh, you can't change that, um, but you can change their skill for aim, run, uh, first aid. I personally um, like having first aid a good deal. This allows you to heal a dying ally. In War Tales, 
if an ally dies in battle fully, they're dead forever, permadeath for them. So you can get them like on death's door, like where they're down, they're lying in a heap and they're dying. And if you have somebody with first aid come over, they can get them up. And uh, you, know, you can, if they get hit again and they get killed, then you know, so much is life. But um, if you can heal them with this, it's, it's really, really nice. So I like to have that. Uh, myself and then traits uh, a random positive trait and a random um, I'm gonna go random positive random positive and then negative uh, you can you know look through these and choose them some of them are annoying um, like extra food just is gonna cost you a lot of money must consume alcohol that's annoying to deal with so what I'm gonna do uh, is just I'm going to go with loafer so his his personal carrying capacity is reduced and I'll go with po uh, random positive traits uh, you could pick them if you want you can see what they are like bloodthirsty is actually really good for an archer I'll pick them never mind and then um, random is like more like let's just see what we got but you can really base these around this particular character type so this is a ranger type character right so i know that i'm going to be shooting i'm going to be wanting to have high accuracy um and i'm going to be dexterity based instead of strength based so uh movement is insane this means you move further on the battlefield very very good uh i'm going to boost uh the dexterity though and then i'm going to name this guy something different which means um Archie, because that's just like the dumbest possible name for an archer. And uh, I'm going to leave that appearance. I like this mustache. So I'm going to close it. And then you can go over here. Um, we have this other ranger. Now, this is a trick. It tricked me. Ranger is not like a Dungeons and Dragons ranger where you like, you know, Strider and you live in the woods and you have a bow. And it's like thief. When you see ranger in this game, think sneaking, backstabbing, dagger wielding thief. Uh, so just know that. And given that, uh, he's got first aid. That's good. We'll have two people with first aid. And then this guy is also going to want to uh, be nimble. And I'm going to go with movement for this dude. And negative, again, I'm going to go with just he can't carry as much. Um, Tinnick is, um, you know, a hilarious, a weird name. I'm going to go with Chops because I love this guy's mutton chops. And so we're just going to say, okay... And uh, I'm going to keep his appearance, and we're going to close it up. Then she is uh, she's a sword and board swordsman. So uh, taunt is a good one. Now with her, you can actually choose her starting weapon. So with the the archer, you can't. It's bow. But with her, you can go sword. You can go two handed sword. So it's do you want to go sword and board or um, two handed sword? I like having a shield. For survivability and so i'm going to go with uh sword and we're going to go with um, brawny for constitution and strong for strength and then for the negative we're actually not going to take loafer um we're going to take uh pickpocket she just costs more money wages are money that you have to pay to your mercenaries every so often every you know few days it'll tell you you have to pay these people up so an extra three crowns is not the end of the world, but I need her to carry stuff because she, I want her to have heavy armor. So uh, this skill, like you can go with whatever here, but uh, Wrath gives you like an extra attack that you can do if they're below 50% and you have a Valor Point. So it just gives you an extra damage option. In my opinion, in War Tales, you're going to get Valor Points which are basically special abilities you can use in combat. And what you want are the most opportunities for doing damage to kill foes before they can kill you. So I like will isolate one target and use everything I can to just narrow the playing field uh, because you can win combat outright if you break the enemy's morale and they decide to run away or it just your life becomes so much easier if they have one less uh, person on their side. So I think Wrath is terrific, and uh, I'm going to change her appearance. Um, yes, 
uh, there's some really good options. I mean, it's so sweet, like, how old they can be. Uh, yeah, okay, this is good. And, uh, you know, uh, she's going to be, uh, let's, you know, Helga uh, is, is just a fantastic name for her, and she's ready to go. So Helga is, uh, you can rotate her, you know, just see what she's got going on. You start with terrible equipment. She's got, like, her mug strapped to her belt. Why not, right? Uh, she's like, I'm ready to drink at a moment's notice. And, okay, that's fine. Her shield is terrible. Her sword is rusty and gross. And she looks like she's wearing a potato sack for clothing. We got to do a better job, and we will. All right, we're going to close this up. And then now we're over here to the Brute. Now, the Brute is very similar. Tanky-type dude. But um, you can change up the Brute to be like two-handed hammer man and that's what we're gonna do so we're gonna make this brute just slam people in the face i'm also gonna take wrath because it's awesome and i'm going to do brawny constitution governs your hit points we'll look at all of this in a moment once you get into the game and you see your characters you can mouse over all of your attributes and see what they do but it's pretty self-explanatory that like if you want frontline fighters you're going to want more hit points and you're going to want more strength so that they do damage can wear better armor all that stuff and as far as his trait um uh yeah fine i'm going to make him expensive as well i i don't mind paying extra money i just don't want surprises or bad things to happen while i'm in combat that's kind of how i feel and I like this guy's appearance, but I think we can do better. Oh my goodness. This haircut with this face, and I mean, it nothing matches about this guy. It looks unbelievable. Um, and so he kind of, you know, has the, the look of, you know, a, a manservant who's fallen on hard times. So, you know, um... Pendleton is the name of a butler who has chosen the way of the hammer. So, fantastic. Okay. So now we've got everybody named. Wait a minute. No, we don't. One of the hilarious things about this game is that you have ponies. Well, you start with one. You can get more. These things are like your pack animals, so they can carry stuff. You can... They actually level up, which is hilarious, and you can level them to be pack animals or even fight with you it depends on what you want to do uh so you can go and you want um i like having constitution so they can carry more and then um you know uh stocky so these are both going to contribute to them carrying more stuff and then as far as their um you know random traits um i'm going to just reduce their critical hit because this pony is never fighting all right um so, uh, this is Twinkle, and Twinkle is going to be our build the pony, not fight, carry the stuff. So, we're good to go. They do start able to fight, but I myself, I just can't see, come to terms with being in a situation where my pony would be killed in combat. I don't think I could get over that emotionally. So I like to just keep them back as a uh, beast of burden, but you do what you want. All right, so now everybody is good and I'm gonna click start. All right, so there's not much story in this game. It kind of emerges as you go. It's more of just a sandbox. So at the beginning, your companions are off in search of adventure, that's our deal. We just want adventure. After a few days of quietly traveling along, their only feat was not getting lost, and they have reached their destination. Here, surely, awaits some novel and exciting quest that will stir up the uneventful lives of bored apprentices. We're bored. We decided we'd rather go fight and murder. Adventure awaits at the end of the road. For those who make it there alive, that is. Dun-dun-dun. Okay. Now, as far as I understand it, we're going to start at different points on the map. You might start at the exact same place that I do. Some of the stuff is random, like where certain things are, where patrolling bad guys and good guys are, the quests that you get from the emissary, the drops and things, the resources. A lot of the stuff is randomized, but then some of it is set. So there will be some variability there. I'm pausing the game because I want to just talk about what we see on the screen. So, first of all, in the upper left, 
and running across the top of the screen on the heads-up display or HUD, you're going to see that we have five companions, and we're the Paladins of Misfortune. That's fantastic. And up here, you're going to see that we have five companions, and it just gives you a breakdown when you mouse over it of your bonuses, your buffs, and your our equipment bonuses and everything that we're getting from that. Then you can see this screen for your companions. You can click on this at any time to right click and open up a screen to like look at Pendleton, for example. Now, when we open up Pendleton, it brings up this character window in the middle of the screen and you can just see what they look like right here. You can mouse over this in the bottom left corner to see relationships. People will build relationships with other party members, uh, kind of like Fire Emblem, stuff like that. And uh, XCOM 2, you know, you'll see that this is his name. You can change it at any time. These are the types of weapons he can equip. He can equip shields and you can equip like hammers and maces. Then this is his class and this is his level. If he has a level up to spend, he will get an aptitude point and you over here by this golden arrow in the upper left and it will have a number and you can click on this to spend it. And, um, this shield with the plus sign is his profession. Now, you can click this right away and select a profession, but when you start, the only profession that you know is Tinkerer, and you have to do things in the game to unlock the other professions, and we'll talk about that as we go. It is worth mentioning right here that when I did it, I just picked professions as I needed them and as they became available. I didn't really think about it. I was like, okay, sweet, we need this, let's go. But if you mouse over like Tinkerer, for example, it tells you what it does, which is you can learn recipes and craft and enhance camping gear at the camp workshop. But importantly, at the bottom, it says critical hit plus 2%. Like whoever is a Tinkerer just gets this buff. So if you want to optimize, you want to pick professions that kind of synergize with the job that you are like this guy's a brute critical hit is okay, but I'd rather have that for chops or archie people who are in there trying to crit and just naturally are going to be doing that more often so i'm actually going to click on chops uh and i'm going to right click on him and i'm going to say all right he already has a four percent crit chance and archie actually has a seven percent crit chance because of bloodthirsty so let's stack that up let's say hey we want archie to to crit people with his arrows so i'm going to click on profession and i'm just going to make him a tinkerer like right out of the gate you can change professions at any time but if you do you will reset and go back to level zero on the experience so you're not locked into it but it can be costly if you're far along so at the beginning it doesn't really matter but right now i'm just going to say tinkerer and we'll talk about what that does now moving over into this column in the center you're going to see that i have defense and this shows even when you're in battle, you have hit points in red and above that is your armor. And that's for enemies and for allies. And armor protects your health and maintains guard and you can fix it with uh, these raw materials after battle. And in general, attacks are subtracted from armor before they go through to your hit points unless you have something that ignores your like armor and guard. Then in the uh, center, you're going to see the paper doll for this character. He's got an improvised bow. You can mouse over this and see what it is. It says right here, improvised bow level one. It sells for 20 crowns or it's worth 20 crowns. It weighs 1.5 and it gives you a flavor text description. Then it tells you it gives you dexterity plus two by having it equipped and it gives you the shoot skill. This is really important. When you equip weapons in this game, even if they're of the same type, they might have different skills. And these skills are like the basic skill that you use. They don't cost valor points a lot of the time. It's just your base skill. And it's what you do when you default attack. So sometimes, like for daggers especially, there's a variety of things that you can do. Like you can throw the dagger, or you can hit up close, or you can poison. And you really want to pay attention to which skill you actually want to use. Now, it gives you, if you look to the right of Improvised Bow, there's some blown up boxes where it says shoot and um it tells you how much damage this is going to do five to eight damage to the target and the range nine meters and it's based on dexterity so 
It also, though, requires vigilance. So you cannot use this skill if you're engaged in combat. So if somebody comes up and engages the archer in melee, they cannot shoot. They will have to switch to some other weapon or disengage uh, from combat to get range and then fire. As you'll see when we actually get into a battle, one of the cool things about this game, at least that I like, is generally there's no missing. You will always hit unless the enemy has evasion, but there is no like roll to hit. It's just you're going to hit unless they dodge and they have some kind of dodging skill. And then you, the amount of damage that you do is shown 5 to 8, but then they mitigate that with... Um, some of their own armor and stats and things like that so it gives you a good feel for how much you're going to do and it's not as brutal as like battle brothers when you just outright miss then in the middle you'll see that i have these farmers rags these are basic armor and they give plus five armor i have a head slot i have a belt slot and i have a backpack slot and nothing in those at the moment in the bottom center of this column this is my skill shoot that we just talked about and then I have my first aid skill. Now, first aid, you'll see in the to the right of first aid in the top part of the ribbon on the tooltip, it says one and has that yellow diamond. That means valor points. Valor points are required to use this ability. It takes one. And you earn valor points in battle or by resting. It's kind of like your morale, how good everybody's feeling, sort of. Um, you have a separate morale that will make people scared and run but that's just how i feel like you're feeling uh heroic and you have the surge to do this extra stuff and you have valor points that you earn and they disappear at the end of battle but you can earn them outside of combat or get abilities to earn them during combat so they're an extra resource to manage and we'll talk about them in combat now over here on the right You'll see in the upper right, injuries and status. So if you have any long-term or even short-term effects, you'll see them here. This is how much experience we need to get to the next level. We already start with 50, so we just need 150 to get to the next level. Here's your attributes, and you can mouse over these attributes to see what they do and to see how your attributes are arrived at. If it's in green, it means the base value has been modified, and in this case, it's plus two and plus one. Plus two is from our bow, and plus one is from the trait that we started with. And you can see those traits in the bottom right over here on the far right column. And you can go through, you can see the wages. Like this guy cost 14 um, for wages. He eats three food, and his carrying capacity is only two. So this is very low, but usually carry capacity is not that big of a deal because. Um, you're going to be carrying stuff on your pack animal. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So it's more like what he contributes to the group. Um, so it's not what... I think I kind of maybe like misarticulated this in the beginning, but um, or incorrectly articulated this. His uh, carry capacity does not affect like how many how heavy of armor or what he can carry, how, how heavy his bow can be or anything like that. It's just how much he contributes toward the overall amount of weight your whole group can carry. And what determines what armor you can wear and what weapons you can uh, equip is your job or your class. So uh, that's enough about the character screen. I'm going to close this up and I'm going to push I and you'll see that when I do that in the bottom right, we'll look at our inventory because I was just talking about overall weight. This is your group inventory. It is shared between everyone. You start with raw materials, which you use after fighting to restore 10 armor points and repair your stuff. Medicine is used to heal people back to full health after battle. Food is used when you rest. You need to eat or your people will become unhappy. So you start with apples and bread. So you start with plenty of food. And just like in Baldur's Gate 3, like different food has different values. So the bread is worth four food and the apples are worth two food. And when you rest, you can see how much food you need. Then in the inventory screen, you can um, click in the upper left to like sort this by type, price, weight, or rarity. You see how much money you have down on the bottom. And then this is your weight. Right now, we are at 24.8 weight out of 83. We can carry 83 because we have four people and we have our pony. You can improve this with 
more pack animals, more people, etc. Uh, it just kind of determines like how much treasure you can carry around before you have to go sell stuff. And you can push I to close this window. Now in the upper, uh, well, yeah, let's continue moving um, to the top. So this book with a zero and this kind of like uh, star is your knowledge. This is a tricky part of the game in that there are many nested experience systems happening. Your characters have experience. Then your overall group has knowledge and different categories in which you can spend this knowledge in your compendium. And if I click on this, for example, it opens up the compendium, which you can click on this to open up, or you can open the compendium down here in the bottom right, or push G, and you can spend knowledge points when you earn them. Right now we have zero, and you see we have zero out of 100 um, knowledge experience till, till we get a point, and unlock things like running, for example, which is insane. We're going to open this as soon as we can. And they just give you bonuses or abilities either on the map or as a party or overall and you can look through these here and what they do and some of them you won't be able to see until you do something in the game to unlock them and then also you can see at the workshop because we have a tinkerer this is what we know how to make right now at the workshop camp we can make lock picks uh python which you use for climbing fish hooks rope and then these say question mark we can make torches saddlebags we need a um knowledge point to learn this recipe but you can see this gives you plus 10 carry capacity if you equip your pony with saddlebags for example and then the rest of these have these shields up here have question marks because we don't even know these categories in the compendium yet so you earn knowledge by doing all kinds of things in the game. I like to think of it almost like achievements, like fighting, exploring, doing quests, you know, looting things, interacting with people, just all sorts of different little things that you're doing will earn you knowledge points, crafting items. And then you can spend those on what you like, and we'll talk about those, what to spend it on when we get them. Then as you move over, this category is unknown, but it's basically like the experience that you're gaining toward the main quest in the region but we haven't started the scenario for this region so it's unknown and then this is your your suspicion or like your wanted level that we talked about it starts at zero with this background and it goes up as you steal or do nefarious deeds in the center you're going to see this is the name of the area we're in tiltron county we're on day one it's noon and we're facing north now, this bar right here is your fatigue. It starts full, as you can see, and as it goes down, you're going to need to rest, or people will get really unhappy if you march them beyond when they're tired, and they will perform worse in battle, uh, I do believe. So you always want to rest as this goes down. You can either camp outside, or you can go to an inn in a town to rest. Over here, you can see your happiness. This evolves over time. And um, it tells you if your happiness is minus five, somebody's going to want to leave your group. If it's at seven or above, your maximum valor points go up by one. And if it's at 15, which is the max, you get 15% extra experience. And then any other happiness just adds to your influence, which is the next category, which is a, a resource we use to perform actions, persuade people, lean on our reputation, recruit new companions. Here's our Valor Points. We have two right now out of five. You can raise your maximum Valor Points through various deeds and actions. And um, we have two at the moment. So if we get into a fight, we will start with two Valor Points. And then this is how much food we have. We have 72 food in stock. And consumption is 18, meaning every time we rest, we're going to need to eat 18 food to keep everybody happy. So it says in parentheses four days, meaning like this 72 food will last me four days. But if I add more people to the party, then we're going to need more food and that calculus will change. And then we see how much money I have. Now in the bottom right, there's some new buttons. This is the camp icon. You push C to camp or click this. You could camp anywhere, but some places are safer to camp than others. Camping near the road is usually very safe. Camping in the forest, maybe not so much inventory is this treasure chest you could push i or click on that to open it the world map you can push m to open the world map it looks like this 
or um, click on this uh, piece of paper with the magnifying glass in the bottom right, you'll see on this world map, it will the fog of war will uncover as we explore. This is our cone of vision based on which direction we're facing with the camera. And what I think is really important is you'll notice up here, it tells you we've discovered zero out of how many locations. It tells you how many locations are on the map, how many locations we've completed for all of the quests and whatever might be there, and how much scenario experience we've gained. Push M to close that. Then there's the compendium like we talked about. And then finally, as I said, there's a lot of nested experience systems. There's the path button, which you can get to with W or open this. Again, very similar to the compendium. You just do certain actions, and as you do them, you fill up these bars, and you can get new things to unlock over here. Uh, so, for example, in Power and Glory, it says complete five missions, which are quests, and you get a, um, a point in Power and Glory right here. And once we get enough points, five we will then get a point to spend on unlocking something over here. And there's different categories of actions. There's, um, not right now, actually, yeah, here we go. Uh, trade and craftsmanship. So craft 50 items, um, crime, uh, win, you know, five ambushes, and then uh, mysteries and wisdom, collect 100 resources, for example. So I don't really look at these myself to govern what I'm doing unless I'm really close on one. I just kind of do what I'm doing and these just happen over time. All right, so that's a lot of talking, but there's a lot going on in this game, as I said. And now that we have the basics, we could talk about how to move around on the map. So you can use the right mouse button and just kind of uh, ho hold it down, drag it to rotate the camera here. And you can tilt and pan the camera. You can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. You um, Then to move around, on the overworld map, you need to left click and you can double click or just left click. And there's some guys right here that want to fight us. Uh, so you can look at this icon right here, for example. And when they have this like red patch, it means like bandits or thugs. And then over here, you'll see like there is something shimmering. And if I want to go get that, I can just click on it. And I pick up something and it went into my inventory now what did i get uh oh these guys are coming at us okay um and darn we couldn't get the minerals before they decided to come fight us all right so we're going to get into a battle these are bandits so this screen will tell you what you're about to fight we're about to fight some level one troops there's going to be a hoodlum and a poacher so there's two of them and there's four of us this is like a tutorial fight this is going to be a super easy fight for us we should decimate these fools and we will so you just click fight and go to the battle so now we're in combat and you're going to notice the screen looks obviously different from the overworld because now we're going to be in a grid based combat system although the grids aren't displayed uh you'll see in a moment. When your turn comes, play any unit you haven't yet used in the round. You can find out which enemy will then come into play. Prepare your strategy. Continue. So once we get into combat proper, you'll notice that it's nothing like the overworld map and it's grid-based. You see these squares around our characters like I was talking about, but the game doesn't actually display the grid. It kind of does it more uh, organically than that. And let's talk about what we see. So at the top of the screen, you're going to see how many good guys there are versus how many bad guys. So we're in blue. There's four of us. And on the right of this gauge, there's two of them. And they're in red. So if you mouse over the enemies, their boxes underneath them will be red. The outline around them will be red. And if you mouse over your allies, it will be blue or white, depending on which one is selected. Now, this gauge up here explains the tide of battle in terms of the morale. So the morale meter fills up and there are certain thresholds. Right now, um, we're, if we kill one of them, we will get galvanized. Uh, and that means that for one attack, you do double damage. So it's insane. 
and then if you get it past this flag icon, then the bad guys are going to be overwhelmed, and they're going to try to run away, and you can either let them run or just fight them down to the death. Now, um, you can move around the camera in the battle screen by using WASD. You can zoom in and out with the wheel, and you can hold down the right mouse button to drag around like this uh, if you like. Now, this is super important. You see all these blue squares? You can actually drag and drop at the beginning before combat starts, before you act with your first person. You can arrange where your people are on and any of these blue squares is an acceptable starting location. So you see that the bad guys are here. You can't move them, but you can move us. So for example, you know, maybe I want to have uh, the thief up here or Chops the ranger, then Helga um, up front and my archer back here something like this and then we can converge on this character then in the bottom of the screen let's talk about what we see so starting from left to right this is the turn order and this is where war trails is unique from many other turn-based games and is so fascinating these blue diamonds represent you get to act this is like your turn and but what it doesn't say is who gets to act that's because you get to choose whoever you want during that turn as long as they haven't acted yet for the round. Now, this icon with the kind of uh, arrow wheel is telling you when the round ends. So there's four blue diamonds, meaning these are our four people, and you can put them in any order that you want and choose on the fly who you want to act. So it's a really cool system. Now, for, for the enemy, for the most part, it is scripted. You can see if you mouse over... This hoodlum is going to go after I go with two people. And if you mouse over them on this turn order, it will show you where they are. And then you can see she, the poacher, is going to go after we've all acted. She goes last, and then we refresh the round and start all over. So one of the main things you want to do, at least what I like to do, is kill whoever's going to go first, take their turn away, and then try to kill this person before they act. Um, then in the center of the heads up display you'll see the name placard with whoever you have selected so this is helga it shows her armor it shows her hit points and it shows her guard and um this is how much incoming damage uh she is going to mitigate as long as she has armor and if you get attacked from behind 50 percent of that mitigation is ignored then here it gives you her options. Now, the hourglass just means end the turn. You can push the space bar to do that or click that. And then she can move, she can slice, and she can wrath. But wrath is only available if the enemy is at 50% or less health. And then this button in the bottom right lets us run away. Now, what's really important, I'm going to zoom in and show you this, is when you're placing your people before you act, you can just do this freely. You can mouse over move and then make sure if I choose to put Helga here, can she reach this hoodlum? Yes, she can. And she can, has to be, if it says melee on the battle skill that I'm mousing over here, this yellow sword icon on the action bar at the bottom right of the screen, that means she has to be directly next to them. There is no reach at all with this sword. She has to be adjacent to them to use it. But if I push tab and cycle around through my people or just click on them, you could see that Archie is actually going to shoot. And if I mouse over this um, shoot, he can sh fire at anything within this circle of influence. This is his range. So the enemy's not in range. But how do you know how far you have to move to get in range? You'll notice how if I mouse over this, it says 9 meter shot dexterity based. And it says right click to lock preview. If I right click on this, I've locked the preview. And so you see how the circle stays, even if I'm not mousing over it. And then what that means is if I actually click on move, and then I just m go to move somewhere, you see how the area of range moves wherever I'm mousing. And then if I'm going to hit one of the enemies, there will be arrows underneath their feet that indicates they are in range of the attack. Now, I'm not actually moving. I haven't committed everything, anything. I could still move around, but this just helps you plan where you want to put your troops so i could run this guy over here and take a shot now there is friendly fire so you need a clear line of sight unless you are directly behind your ally 
um, then you could fire over their shoulder like in Battle Brothers. But you want to have a clear line of fire if you plan on shooting and not hitting your ally. So that is how you could tell if you're in range with a ranged attack while moving by using the preview. Now you can just push escape um, to get out of that or you can just push tab to go to another character. And I could still move this guy around. Like I could start him over here if I wanted. That's fine. And once I have this set, then it's time to actually act with one of my people and choose the order in with which I want to attack. So I'm going to be honest with you here. We don't have that many abilities with our people, and these foes aren't that formidable because we're early days. So the decision-making will get quite more involved as we develop, as we have more choices at our disposal. But for now, we can just get some of the basics in line. So the first thing that we want to look at is we know that this hoodlum right here by mousing in the lower left on the turn order is going to be the first one of the enemy group to go first. I get two turns before this hoodlum acts. So if I could take out this hoodlum, then I will get two turns before this hoodlum can even act, and it's possible that we finish this fight entirely before they get to go. Now to do that, I'm going to need to, to make sure of a few things. Number one, I need to be able to reach and kill this hoodlum and reach and kill this hoodlum with the remaining troops. So for example, if I click on Pendleton here and I push 1, I see that Pendleton from this starting position can move up and be adjacent to the poacher. So we've got range there. Then with Chops, Chops can move over and also be in range. Helga is more than in range to get on this hoodlum and... Archie is able to, um, you know, if we look at this and you know, right click on this and push one, we see that we can move here and he will be in range to shoot either one. So in, in terms of like where we're positioned, we're fine for being within range for both of these units. But this hoodlum has 22 health and, you know, Helga, our sword and board fighter, Uh, you know, she is going to do five to six damage. So we're probably not going to be able to kill right now. However, um, this character's ram ability um, does five damage and it's AoE. <laughs> and we have six to eight damage right here. So... And our archer has 5 to 8. Instead of then planning to annihilate, because we can't, we need to reframe our strategy. So what I'm going to do is I am going to move in with Helga. And I'm actually going to move her right here. And attack with Slice by clicking on it. And then just, uh, you can left click on this character when you're adjacent. Now, once this happens and you have your ability selected, you can either push two or select from the action bar in the bottom right. You'll notice as I mouse over this applicable character, the hoodlum, it shows you it's going to do five to six damage and it's going to come off of that top bar, which is their armor. So that's a prediction of how much damage I'm going to do. It has a variable range, but it's you know not that large. Now, that does not calculate if I get a crit, which would do more damage than that, of course, but this is what I can expect. I'm going to do it. I'm going to left-click to confirm, and bam, we hit for six. Now, this is explaining engaging. When you perform a melee attack on a free enemy, you engage them. An engaged unit can only attack their engaged opponent and has a higher chance of taking critical damage. Take advantage of this with your other units. An engaged unit is exposing their back, and if you attack them from behind, you get a bonus. So, that changes things a little bit, because I could go over here with Chomps, and I could move um, Chomps behind. However, before I do anything, you have to push Spacebar or click on the Hourglass to end the turn. I was going to push Spacebar. Then I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to say I could move... 
And if I wanted to move all the way over here behind this unit, I can stab. Now notice how I'm going to do a bunch of damage to this guy. And we have a chance of critting with our character. And I'm going to do this because of the engaged situation. The You'll see the cross swords above the two units that are engaged. And I'll do this. And you see that that number was gold. That was 11. That was a crit. That was actually more damage than the 6 to 8 that was advertised. And we crit. And it says right here, ambush. Increase the critical hit chance by an extra 30%. So what this means, and you can see the tooltip popping up there. This is triggered when we attack an enemy from behind. You can only attack an enemy from behind if they are engaged with another unit and they are unable to turn to face you. If you try to attack an enemy, even if they're facing the other way and there's nobody engaging them, they will just turn around and face you. So you need to do this, and this is uh, at least something I enjoy doing quite a bit in War Tales, is this combo of having a sword and board go in, engage, and then having my stabber or ranger go in and do massive damage with a backstab. So now um, I'm going to end the turn by pushing spacebar. Now I could, however, move. I, I have more stuff I could do. So chops can still move. I have remaining movement. Right? Everybody has a certain amount they can move per turn, and it's based on the character, the equipment, etc. And I could actually move again. So you can move, attack, and move in this game, which is really, really useful. I don't need to do that right now, but it's not a bad idea. And this would be like if I was worried about this guy getting a retaliation from the hoodlum, but the hoodlum is engaged, so he's probably going to fight the person he is engaged with. But if I wanted to, I can move away now you can only move away from a unit that you're adjacent to if it's not engaged with you if you try to do this and um they aren't engaged or they are engaged with you you'll see that a little arrow will appear meaning like you're going to get attacked walking through their threatened zone like an attack of opportunity but this guy doesn't have to worry because this hoodlum is occupied with helga so i'm going to move chops up here now why am i doing that i'm moving chops up here because I don't want this guy to actually make the decision that he wants to try to spin around and hit Chops. Chops doesn't have... Look at Helga. She's got 10 armor. Chops has 5. Helga has a shield. She's meant to be, you know, tanking. And if this guy did want to run over here and now try to hit Chops, Helga would get a free hit as he exited her threatened area. So he's not going to do that. So this kind of just protects Chops. And also, you could see I could even use first aid. Why can I use first aid? Because I still have valor points that I can use. Once a, an ability has been used up, all of my movement and my base action, you see that these are grayed out. Can't do them anymore. But this ability is still here because I do have valor points to spend. Now this becomes more important when I actually have something useful to do. I don't. So I'm just going to push space bar. Now he's going to go and he hit Helga for four and he poisoned her. Now, the poacher is going to go. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually, uh, yeah, I'm going to have Archie take a shot. Now, if you'll notice right here, if I try to shoot the hoodlum, you see that there's a skull above the damage predictor, meaning I am predicted to kill this opponent. However something you always have to be careful of when you're firing with an archer is friendly fire. In this situation, you'll see in there's little percentages above their heads. I have a 26% chance to hit my own unit from this position and a 74% chance to hit the bad guy. Now, if I moved up, you know, here, however, and then I fired... I have a 100% chance to hit the bad guy and no chance to hit myself because, or my own, my ally, because there's nothing blocking this shot. So it's pretty intuitive. You just need to move around. Now, another tip, though, is if I move the archer, I didn't have enough movement. But if you move directly behind one of your units, just like in Battle Brothers, you can fire over their shoulder, kind of, and fire through them without any chance of hitting them. But, you know, from an angle, you have a chance. So I move this guy up and I'm going to fire right here. And bam, that unit is dead. Now, a few things are going to happen. 
you'll see the momentum bar or the uh, morale bar up here moving. And that means that our units are excited because we're turning the tide of battle. This number went down to one because there's only one of them left. And everybody got galvanized. And galvanized, if you have a buff, you can always just mouse over the buff. You see it down here in the bottom right. We get an extra 50% damage. So that's incredible. I'm going to push spacebar, end turn, and I'm going to run up with Pendleton. However, you need to be careful with Pendleton's ability because it is affects all units in a, um, the area. So I'm going to right-click to have the preview. And I want to move my person up in such a fashion that they will not hit my ally. So you see, if I moved here, I could hit both of them, but I don't want that. But if I move here, I will only hit the bad guy. So I'm going to move all the way over here, and then I'm going to use this ram ability. I'm going to left click, and you see I get to rotate my character, and it's this huge area of influence. So you can aim it. I can actually hit my own unit, and you see that they glow blue if they look like they're going to get affected but really it's usually um you have to see these arrows at their feet to know you're going to hit and you see i'm going to do 10 damage so i'm going to just do it like this bam 10 damage because and i got extra damage because i was galvanized and now this poacher has to engage pendleton this is important because they're not going to get to fire their bow they're going to have to do something else because I've moved up on them. It's a great way to neutralize a ranged unit. And Chops over here is now no longer threatened, most likely. So we're going to push um, Spacebar and end a turn. And yep, indeed, they punched me for two damage, which is nothing. So that completely ruined their chance of winning <laughs> because they had to use their fist instead of their bow. And... Now we get to act, and we have all four turns before they get to go. Remember, I can act with whomever I want, so I'm actually going to go with Chops and move behind this unit because we will get the ambush bonus, and we're also galvanized. And you see that the tooltip damage, 9 to 12, reflects the boosted damage from galvanize. So if I click here, I'm going to do a bunch of damage, and in fact, you get that lethal animation there because we did a crit for 16 damage because of the 30% boost to crit chance from behind, from the ambush. All right, so once we win, we now move into the victory screen. From here, you see the loot. Uh, we got a dagger, and we got some playing cards, which is just a trinket that we can sell. We get 45 experience points and 10 influence. And there's also some um, human remains that you can take. I don't take them. There is a cannibalism trait that you can pick up if you're interested in eating people for role-playing purposes or whatever your shtick is. Uh, I, I don't personally engage in the consumption of human flesh, but, you know, do what you will. So if you click loot all, uh, you don't take the bodies, but you take the other stuff. And it goes over here to your bottom right into your inventory. Then you'll see down here two um, pieces of armor need repaired. And we can repair all. However, this is a tip that was given to me. This is a choice that you have. You don't have to click repair all. The reason you wouldn't click repair all is because a raw material restores 10 points of armor. But you'll notice that neither of these people actually took 10 damage. So we're using the raw materials to repair more armor than we probably need to however because we're early i'm going to just click repair all but do this based on your own amount of materials your own comfort and understand that you are overkilling and you might want to actually not repair and save up however if you don't repair you will start the next fight with your armor depleted uh, you're, we didn't take any health damage, even though she got poisoned. That that doesn't linger after the battle. And we don't have to use any medicine or anything. All we have to do is repair the armor. This up arrow right here by Pendleton means that he actually leveled up in the fight. So I'm going to repair the stuff. I'm going to click on Pendleton. And Pendleton has leveled up. 
And what this means is you can go over here and click this to raise our aptitude. And we get a few things. We get to raise our attributes and we get to sometimes at certain levels pick specialization skills. So Pendleton is a brute, but he's using this two-handed weapon. So I would rather he be somebody who uh, does a bunch of damage, DPS more than a tank. But you can also make a hybrid depending on what you want to do. So a Vanguard, it says uh, you get to charge in and deal five damage to all units in their path and apply slowdown, like the Juggernaut. Now pay attention, you get plus one strength and all you can get is medium armor. And you get the Valor ability, uh, Relentless Charge. So it's something to do with those Valor points. Smasher, also medium armor. And it gives uh, applies two poisons to bleeding units. So they have to be kind of um, bleeding first. And then Destroyer lets you wear heavy armor and do a weakening blow and gives you constitution. So interestingly... I said I wanted to do DPS, so I should take Smasher or Vanguard for that purpose. Vanguard says uh, disengage and charge in a straight line. So this will let you disengage if you want um, and run through a big group of enemies if you're interested. These abilities down here, you get to pick any of these that you want. It doesn't matter which one of these that you pick. Uh... Honestly, I'm going to try Smasher. And Poison Impact, even if you don't poison them, it's just a AoE damage ability. So we'll take Smasher, and we're going to say OK. You'll see that their uh, job has changed to Smasher. And then we have Attributes. Now, these attributes you get to raise up, and you can click here. And these pluses mean that it will go up. It will go up. These are not available to raise right now. Dex, Constitution, and Willpower. And Strength actually goes up by two. And that's what we want anyway. Because if you mouse over this, you can see in parentheses, this is a two meter area ability and it's strength based. So because it's strength based, we want strength with this character. If I click on this, our strength will actually go to 11. And now... We're doing seven damage with poison impact instead of um, five because the strength directly affected that. And even our base attack is going to be stronger as a result of that. Now, um, I might want this character to be a tinkerer, but we already have a tinkerer who is... Um... Oh, did I not click chops? Oh, that's right. I clicked the archer because the, I wanted the archer. Right, 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 right. So we have a Tinkerer, and Chops or the Archer would be fine for that, and we're good. We don't know any other professions, and we're fine. Now, the other thing we could do is go over to Chops, um, just right-click on Chops, and then we can look at this dagger. So currently, we're using the Rusty Shiv. This thing has Dex plus 2 and gives us Stab. This Damage Dagger gives you plus 3 Dex, and it gives you Poisoning, however. So... This deals 6 to 8 damage and applies a poison, which is a damage over time. You can see there they lose 5% of their health at the start of the turn. It does it gives you more dex and does 6 to 8 damage, okay? But I actually like this weapon better because I like the ambush myself. You can use whatever, but just pay attention to what equipment you're getting and what you want to use. If you want to poison, rock out. Go for it. I'm going to keep it as is. Then we push escape and we just say continue. And we're back out on the road. And now we're on the open road. Nobody is pursuing us. I'm going to pick up this iron ore. We got four pieces. And we're cooking with gas. Everybody, this is a good place to end this first episode of our War Tales Beginner's Guide. We got into a fight. We made a team. We understand the basics of the UI. And we're going to get into more in this series as I explain how to play the game. Because there's a lot going on under the hood with this game. But... Once you get some of the intricacies, I'm telling you this is a fantastic strategy RPG sandbox experience. And I'll check you in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.